fascinated by the OER discussion and how that's complementary to, you know, the accessible needs. And uh, I know our previous session, they were mentioning how they were going that extra mile to make their content as accessible as they knew how. And that's perfect. Um, so love to hear that and would love to hear more stories from others around us that are doing the same. And I, I think, you know, throughout this next hour, we're going to probably try to set some context uh, between two avenues. Uh, one is from uh, a consumer of open and what vetting process you might be used, be able to use to actually select content that's accessible. And then from a creator standpoint, is that if you're creating or revising something, what are the steps you need to do to make sure that it's accessible to the broader, broadest audience? And I thought, Karen, I might just give a, a definition of, of, of accessibility from, from my standpoint. This isn't the official Office of Civil Rights inside the Department of Education, but this is a commonly accepted uh, definition around accessibility being the removal of systematic barriers, including policies, procedures, or practices that unfairly discriminate and can prevent individuals from participating fully in a situation. And oftentimes systematic barriers are put into place unintentionally. And so talking about open education materials, digital materials must be designed and developed so that people with all abilities can use those. So when we talk about accessibility, many times folks immediately go to uh, uh, low vision, no vision, hard of hearing, deaf. And there are so many other disabilities within that spectrum that we have to be cognizant of. Um, those seem to be the ones that the screen readers, the assistive technology focus on and what the, the web uh, accessibility standards focus on. But we wanna make sure that we're thinking about folks that maybe have physical impairments, so mobility, the ability to move a mouse or the ability to use a keyboard to navigate through a document. Uh, we wanna think about um, cognitive disabilities, about using appropriate colors or using appropriate white space within design so that there's not an overload. Karen, feel free to jump in here uh, of some <laughs> other design considerations. Sure. Um, I see we've already got one question posted uh, to please discuss how software like Uja uh, has influenced OER. And I would have to say that's going to have to be to the audience. I, I have uh, no direct knowledge of how that might be. I know uh, Uja is um, a uh, software that will help with providing accessibility for especially documentation, blind low vision. Uh, that's, and, but I, I have not uh, had a whole lot of experience with this particular tool. So I welcome anybody in our audience that might have some specific thoughts on that to well, I'll, Must, I'll, uh, Maybe you I'll do talk about that in, in broad form because user panorama is one platform that basically does uh, accessibility vetting or scoring and might do some file conversion. Um, Blackboard Ally is another tool. Um, if you don't know, the University of Central Florida has developed its own platform that's open source called You Do It that's integrated into Canvas um, and is available through City Labs as a, as a commercial product. I think where those platforms certainly help is that if you have a resource that maybe isn't fully compliant, these tools sometimes offer alternate uh, formats that can be more accessible. There's other tools like Census Access that do file uh, format transformation so that it will take a text-based document and output it into an MP3 so somebody can actually hear instead of try to read. I think that these uh, these tools certainly help um, along the lines of the same of Microsoft Office as Accessibility Checker or Adobe Acrobat's Accessibility Checker. So for creators, it certainly helps go through and point out common errors that impact screen readers and assistive technology. Um, I think you can also run you know, if tools or, or resources that you're adopting through these same checkers to see if you really should implement those or or if you have to do some type of remediation. You know, I think the key piece about OER is that the open license really does afford you the ability to go and edit a document to make it more accessible. Um, 
one of the common challenges we've had with commercial publisher materials is that you do have to go back to their development shop. You do have to point out what that change or what that barrier is. And you do have to wait for their team to go and remedy that and then redistribute that. That could be hours, weeks, days, months, what have you. Um, if you've got the skill or you have resources on your campus, you can make that change in minutes or hours um, because of that open license piece. I see there's another question in there, Karen. Yeah, um, and I was, I had a couple of slides. I'll, I'll see if I can get those back. Um, they disappeared on me as I was trying to get a better look at the Q&A here. Um, yeah, I think it's really important to communicate with students. Uh, I know in the past when um, I have taught courses and worked with faculty that have video content in their courses, especially where students are making their own video content uh, to help them, uh, you know, develop a script and develop the captioning, um, you know, have a transcript available. Anyway, just, you know, really bringing to mind that, you know, even in the document, you know, are they watching for headers and other simple things that uh, they may be aware of, but maybe not. But I think us as faculty, our job is to raise that awareness. And, you know, I think a nice way is to kind of ease into it, like maybe at the beginning of the semester, you offer extra credit or something a little more motivating to make that extra effort. And then perhaps as the course goes along or if there are future courses, you could make that more of a requirement. But uh, I think most of all, it's just raising awareness. Um, some are right on it and they know, but a lot do not. And uh, they may not really understand clearly what you may be expecting. Um, so making sure that you're very clear what uh, you are expecting from those students to deliver to make that content more accessible. You know, it, it, I often say, you know, it, nothing happens without a conversation. And that's a really important conversation to have and to make sure that it's clear. So I hope that helps. I'll, I'll add on to the, the question regarding student engagement and, and activities. Um, yesterday, we talked uh, for some time about open pedagogy as a way to invite students to collaborate and contribute towards a resource. Um, there is a colleague uh, from another institution that had created a lesson plan specifically for teaching students about the basics of accessibility so that the students understood the importance of making content accessible, but also had the fundamentals to do so, so that they, when they went to go construct whatever component of the open pedagogy assignment, they had the, at least the bare basic skills to, in order to make that accessible. And there was some guidance there. So that particular faculty member integrated that lesson piece into his overall assignment structure. Now, looking at I can only guess maybe folks are talking about maybe press books and maybe H5P and whether those interactive elements are accessible. And I do know that press books is actively working to build in a accessibility checker into a, an upcoming platform release. They're also looking to enhance some of the H5P integration. So that's definitely top of mind. But I do think the major repositories, whether it's OpenStax, Merlot, um, LibreTex, even Lumen Learning have put a lot of time and attention into making their, their core products accessible. You know, uh, looking at one of the other ones here, what tools do you suggest for checking open education uh, accessibility? Karen, do you want to, I'll throw in some, but do you want to reference tools you sure. know off the top of your head? Um... I see, and I, I'm assuming that's you put in there, uh, you do it. And I trust that's a link that'll work to give you more information. Um, you do it's really great for checking uh, content within Canvas. Um, now, I'll share a little story. Um, Kevin's gotten some familiarity with this as well. Um, you know, it's possible, for example, to put a press book 
within Canvas. And we had a faculty that did a very interesting <laughs> arrangement with Pressbooks uh, where he was putting more focus on uh, including video content. And then he was also layering some H5P elements that would allow the videos to pause and kind of ask little quiz questions along the way. And so we had all these layers within Canvas and, um, you know, I'll be honest, I did not run you do it to uh, identify that. That was found through a manual review, uh, which is what we often do to make sure we're catching everything possible that the instructor's using that has multimedia uh, involved. But because um, you do it is it's getting there, but it's its strength is not on the multimedia side as much as um, content within the rich content editor. So. Anyway, that point aside, we had to do a lot of uh, exploring how to make that video content accessible within the Pressbooks environment, also with this H5P overlay. Now, we, we did find some ways and we had to kind of, you know, bend some things and it wasn't perfect and ideal, but for the most part, uh, it actually worked out pretty well. And so, you know, I, you do it and tools like that, that's a starting point. I really want to emphasize that, that, you know, gives you a point to say, hey, uh, okay, generally that looks good, but maybe this is not so sure and we need to look into it. Um, or, you know, like in a captioning environment, you know, that's something you'll have to take forward in a different direction outside of uh, you do it. Um, so WebAIM uh, has their, you know, color checker and, other things that it'll help evaluate in a uh, public web page. So there are lots of tools out there. I see we've got a wonderful list developing there. Um, but I think the caution is, you know, just like with any other, you know, machine tool, uh, AI, whatever we're happening to use, we really need that human element to verify what's truly going on. Um, and if you have a really complex issue, like you're trying to determine, you know, if the keyboard situation is, uh, you know, working the way it should, and you're not sure that what you've got is testing that, you know, get to those uh, support resources and see what they can do to help you out. Uh, it's often a team effort. I, I think it's, it's, you know, you can get a pretty good run in most cases, uh, using these tools and following the guidance you get, but um, there are a lot of folks, I'm sure, at your institution that are ready and willing to help, and I'm not always sure we ask them as often as we could. Uh, so I know I would love to hear from faculty more often, and I often don't, you know, unless I've got a problem I really can't resolve. So I would just encourage that communication with Again, the starting point, yeah, you know, I, for example, I ran you do it, and there's a couple of things here I'm not sure about. Can we talk about it? Yeah, that, that would be a very worthwhile conversation, because you'll probably learn something, and your students will benefit. Karen, you're right. There's, there's a great growing list of resources that are, are being added, and I'm adding a couple here as well. So um, I encourage folks, if they've come across their favorite resource, please um do so, please yes. add. Mm -hmm. I am trying to do. But if others have questions, please don't hesitate. Uh, just checking the, the chat as well. You know, Amy has a great question within the, the chat. Um, what I've seen is that there generally are policy requirements for faculty and staff to become uh, trained or at least become aware of accessibility standards or related to policy. But generally, those policies shall fall short of requiring students. Um, and it's unless those students are producing something on behalf of the university like a student life group or what have you, but generally there's some staff involved that holds the responsibility. But I, I, you know, if we're going to be promoting open pedagogy or having students contribute towards public works, we really need to give the students the right tools. 
Um, there is a growing list of resources that are in that Google Doc that can be used, but I will add at some point in time afterwards, the lesson plan that I had referenced earlier um, that was basically just a, a week uh, module for, for an instructor that wanted to use uh, accessibility as the foundational piece for their open pedagogy works. Um, accessible OER, let's see, we said OpenStax, uh, LibreTex, Merlot has some good ones. I'm going to add Lumen Learning, um, whether you agree that they're open or not, we'll just add that to the list. <laughs> yeah, that's a whole discussion by itself, isn't it? Is it OER or no? So then there's one, is the... Um, who are your OER accessibility experts? Are they users of assistive technology? Are they providing feedback to the to the accessibility of OERs? Karen, I'm going to let you grab that one first because <laughs> you are, are are part of the front line. Um, as kind of in a way, recently, yeah. Um, I mean, I haven't dabbled all that much, honestly, in OER, um, with the exception of maybe uh, some work in a little bit with Pressbooks. Uh, but my team is uh, getting more opportunity to uh, work with specifically Pressbooks. Um, other OER content, I know within the scope of my general uh, role that I play with the accessibility reviews uh, are pretty much whatever's within web courses and so, uh, or Canvas in this case. And, you know, generally, I would say, just like any document that you're putting together, you know, if you are building a book, um, you know, there, there's just some best practices to follow, you know, making sure you've got good headers and that your ordering is appropriate and your text is an appropriate color and your backgrounds, etc. cetera. Um, so I'll be honest, I'm, I'm still very much on the introductory edge in terms of the direct OER environment, but um, but at least from what I've experienced so far, it's, it's really nothing unusual or different. It's just that it is a, um, a different environment, right? You know, so maybe it's not directly in your LMS, but it is an environment that you can certainly probably have a variety of ways of evaluating how accessible it is for uh, your students. I think the other thing to kind of keep in mind too is if you are adopting content from an OER environment and you know putting it into a new environment, for example, in your LMS, uh, that you're just checking, double checking that it's still compliant you know, something didn't quote unquote get lost in translation uh, as you moved it over to that new environment. So checking, double checking, it's always a good thing. Amy Trigger has a great comment slash question in, in the chat that's really talking about format. And so access, we're, we're talking about from a, a accessibility standpoint, but really talking about within in the context of open, making sure that the format that you're using is available to all. And we had a question, I think, uh, perhaps on Tuesday during our OER basics on whether or not an LMS like Canvas is a good place to author OER. And if it's a familiar format and it's a familiar platform, it makes life easier. But um, when you think about providing the broader community access, it is a closed off system. It is password protected. Not everybody's using Canvas across the globe. So then you get into proprietary formats. And while there are some standards to export the content, it doesn't always come, uh, doesn't always transfer or export correctly or import into another system. And even taking a step further from that is that if you're looking for students to collaborate within a, a given space, making sure that students have access to that tools and that there isn't a cost burden for those students. So if your campus is providing Microsoft Office, then Word is just as good as any other tool to collaborate or a Google Docs if you support that. Um, you can always convert 
the Word document to a different platform, whether that's Pressbooks, LibreText, what have you, but really thinking about it from the forefront of what are the barriers for the students to, to uh, contribute, but also you can take that raw source material and then transfer, transfer it to somebody else. So if they don't have a particular format, they can work in Word or in Google Docs and reconstruct that uh, original source OER to whatever format they need. So Amy, thank you for, for pointing that out. Let's see, there's a question about uh, designing in RISE. I, and I will echo Amy's comments. I don't have experience specifically in RISE. Um, there are efforts that you, you will need to make, whether it's Articulate or Lectoro or Soft Chalk. Um, generally, those design platforms have accessibility measures, but sometimes you have to take a little bit of extra effort and go into the community to find out some of the widgets, especially if there's interactivity that's built into the learning slide that you're working in. Yeah, I know, um, I don't know, a semester or two ago, I encountered a faculty that was using um, some kind of feature in RISE that was uh, kind of like a narrated PowerPoint. You know, they had uh, audio and then slides. And thankfully that instructor had the foresight to employ, I think it was the notes section, but they put their transcript there. So it wasn't ideal because it wasn't captioning, but it was pretty close. And that was about the best we could do with that particular tool for that particular need. So uh, I don't know if um, the comment about it being a nightmare, if that was something else, <laughs> uh, accessibility, oriented, maybe more text or visual oriented possibly, but there there are workarounds. So yeah, so I think just keeping your eyes out for what, what can be done. And then uh, I think a lot of times we maybe tend to forget, but a lot of times the text equivalent is what the student is looking for. Maybe just communicating with that student what their preferences are. I think that's always an enduring challenge because I think while the pandemic did help heighten uh, the need to self-disclose and get that support uh, a little bit more, I, I feel like it's kind of settling back and people, students are starting to feel a little more reticent to self-disclose again. So, um, you know, and again, I think that really encourages us to take that more universal design approach and just say, hey, you know, we're doing the best we can, but, you know, keeping that conversation open so that students will let us know when they encounter barriers and we can, figure out how to how to get that worked out to produce them. There's a great question in the, in the chat, Karen, is, is the requirement to have both a transcript and closed captioning for any video or presentation? Um, so it, it, is that a hard and fast rule to have both closed captioning and the transcript? Uh, I would say it nothing's hard and fast, you know, because, um, you know, just because it has captioning doesn't necessarily mean it's great captioning, right? You know, you want to make sure that you're not leaning on automatic or something like that. Um, but I know for, when I'm supporting students that have qualified for deaf, hard of hearing support, I will do my best to make sure they have both. However, right, I would, uh, recommend very much that especially for any lecture over 10 minutes you know i know for me i have a learning preference of being more visual i'd love to be able to read and summarize things so you know a universal design approach i think would say yes if you can provide a transcript please do um because those of us that maybe don't have time to deal with the audio or just want to glance and get some some major points, uh, you know, like even for our presentations and things like that. If if that's at all possible, uh, I would recommend it. But hard and fast rule, um, no, I, I don't think we need that kind of pressure. But I think you do want to make sure you've got at least one or the other that is, uh, you know, well done. That it's not automatically generated and left alone. That it's been human reviewed and. It's, you know, serviceable for human eyes <laughs> to uh, take information away with. So does that make sense? 
And, and I would I would answer that in the, in a similar way that it, it, it depends. It depends on your institutional context and your policy. It also just depends on your country's laws. Um, you know, if the video, the closed captioning does not capture the the conversation correctly, especially if there's overlapping voices or there's multiple uh, speakers at the same time, the transcript can certainly help. And then uh, we, we're not even getting into sort of audio descriptions. If there are sound effects or other elements that in are important to the storytelling within the video, those will not necessarily be captured captioned because uh, it's not spoken text, it's background noise. So you the transcript or descriptions may capture those those important elements. Yep, absolutely. No, Karen, I, I was wondering, you know, as we field some more questions here, the role of artificial intelligence in supporting accessibility. I'm going to throw a link into an emerging tool from Arizona State University where they're developing uh, an, an image accessibility generator. So it would essentially generate the, the, the alt text for images that would be appropriate for the, the actual uh, context for the image. And so AI is getting smarter each and every time. Um, you can test chat GPT and you can throw something in there and say, can you make this accessible? Um, you know, there are different code snippets that you can use if you're doing websites and that it'll produce accessible code back for you. So Karen, I'm just wondering if you've played with any tools, especially around AI, that seem that they're promising. Um, I, and I've been presenting kind of on that topic because um, there, again, there are a lot of tools and "quote unquote" machines that you know AI that will uh, generate. And generally, even uh, the current caption vendors, they start with their AI. They run their their video content through whatever tool they're using. And then the next step and the reason you're paying them is because they have human editors go through and make sure, you know, it's not an incorrect homonym or, um, you know, other things that are like the fillers, which we all are notorious for, but don't serve us well when we're trying to read. So I think the, the tools are rapidly improving. I know uh, in my team, there's a lot of use of Whisper AI and trying to you know, help get that tool to serve more people and faculty. Um, and, and we are using it, but again, it's a starting point. It is not the, you know, you don't plug and play and post it and say you're done. You, you'd be wise to make sure you've gotten some human review uh, involved. So uh, there are some, you know, and it gets better, but I, I definitely would continue to just quote unquote, sound the alarm that it's not a one and done process. You know, we need to have, uh, you know, a start and the machines are great and the tools are great, but don't let that be the finishing point. Let that be the starting point. Yeah, there's, there's a great question in the document that's, uh, what do we think are the top priorities for elements or content within a con within a document that faculty should prioritize if 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 they have to do something, and uh, Karen, I, I answered first, and I'd love to have you follow up. Is uh, document structure I think is important. Headers, bullets, you know that makes it screen reader accessible, and then from there, alt text for images and descriptive links for any web addresses within the given document and then captioning for videos. Do you, do you have any other ones that you think that should be added to that list? Um, color can be an issue uh, for many. Um, you know, they may not be blind, but they may be low vision and have uh, color contrast issues. So, and, you know, I'm sorry, I'm not getting any younger and I'm finding my eyes uh, also, just in a general sense. I'm, I don't necessarily distinguish uh, things may be as clearly as I used to. I don't hear things as clearly as I used to. I know for sure. So, um, you know, but again, trying to just serve everybody, you know, make sure your your colors aren't too wild or, you know, 
hard to distinguish. Um, you know, and I think most of us are familiar now that, you know, photocopied PDFs are a, a big no-no because -no that's essentially an image and you need to get that converted to text. But even then, you know, if the text hasn't uh, been copied very well, it can be a problem. Uh, it still may not be good quality text. So, um, you know, you may want to dig a little farther and see if there's already a digital version of that text that already exists. Um, but yeah, all the, you know, kind of standard things, especially, you know, if, if we're trying to put together a, you know, open educational resource, uh, we really do want to make sure that it is properly organized, even just for it to publish nicely. And so a lot of those things that would also serve in the accessibility side, I think, you know, those are just great things to keep in mind. It all works together. I see in the chat that uh, Danielle had mentioned um, OpenAI's Whisper technology, and that's something that we've used within UCF um, to yep. do meeting transcripts and summaries. And we've been playing that a little bit with captioning. And based on what I've heard, we've gotten up to 95% or higher accuracy with AI generated captioning. So there's some great promise with some of these AI technologies. Yes. And I'll say that kind of the big test for me right now and Whisper, I think is coming along. I'm not sure they're there yet, but when you've got multiple speakers. Um, and so ClipChamp is another tool that uh, many of us have used and um, Adobe Premiere has some really exceptional, if you're into you know higher levels of software, uh, that, that's also got a really nice uh, captioning environment. Uh, to get some precision. So I, and Otter AI, uh, again, many of us are probably familiar with Otter AI. I'll be honest, I, I lean toward when I've got multiple speakers. So, cause that one will distinguish different voices. And I understand Whisper is getting there, but um, Whisper I find most helpful when it's just a single speaker. See, there was a question about NVDA and um, I'm not sure if there was a specific question, but um, if folks are familiar with assistive technology, you may often have heard JAWS referenced as sort of a, the premier screen reader, but NVDA is a free alternative that is also assistive technology screen reading. Yes, that is true. I, I will say that, um, you know, if we're just to talk about assistive technology just for a second, there is a free app that I've been playing with that's from Microsoft. Um, and I'm just going to throw it in the chat if I can get my mouse back there. It's called Seeing AI. And it's a wonderful tool that is really designed for those with visual impairments to navigate. Um, the app has multiple features. It can scan handwritten notes and produce a digital version of it. It can recognize different currency and the value of the currency for somebody who can't see that. There's the ability to navigate a room. So if there are chairs or desks in the way, it, it'll basically sense that. Um, it can do color contrast. There's a number of, of, of functions that this free app provides from Microsoft. And again, it's all AI based. So, you know, we're going to see this revolution of tools available that are not only going to help our students who have those, those barriers, but also help us in the design so that they aren't faced with those barriers from a content standpoint. Just to do a temperature check, is this uh, what you had hoped from us? Are we providing useful resources and, and commentary? Is there anything that you you came, you know, really pressed to, to get an answer with that we haven't addressed yet? Excellent. So Karen, feel free, Do, if you have a few, did you have slides that you wanted to address or? Uh... Um, I could potentially pull those up. Let's see, I finally found them again. It's been a while since I've worked in Google Slides. I was trying to find something that I could share. So um, in fact, maybe I'll do that first and then um, 
So yeah, if you're I doing that, share my I'll screen. A, I'll just put yeah, it in I'll the make, chat for starters. I'll make a comment about uh, captioning. So YouTube has a, uh, a, a platform within it called YouTube Studio that allows you to take videos you upload and um, edit the, tr the, the captioning or the transcript track. And YouTube does automatic transcriptions or, or it produces uh, closed captioning automatically for you if you, if you enable that. Um, just be mindful that you do use that. You know, there is the letter of the law and there's the spirit of the law. Um, just as putting an exclamation mark in an alt text satisfies a technical requirement that you've added something, it doesn't really provide context. The same thing goes is that if you have YouTube create auto captioning without going through and reviewing it, yes, you've provided captioning, but if YouTube in, misinterprets something where you wanted to say, do not do something, and it cuts off the not, you're going to have students doing that action, which is going to probably have an impact on student success in the course. So just be mindful of, of the set it and forget it type of approach. Absolutely. Absolutely. And I, and I um, you know, on my little slides, if any of you have pulled those up, um, you know, I uh, opened with just, you know, both of these are uh, a significant challenge, <laughs> you know, working with OER, um, I'll be honest, it, it's, it's still fairly fresh and new to me uh, from really doing any kind of deep dives and using it. Uh, but the accessibility side, at least, especially for the DHH side of things, I've been very involved and really fascinated by the developments that have happened and continue to happen. Uh, it's a very rapidly changing space. And so uh, I think as the open educational environment continues to also expand, uh, it's, it's a very dynamic environment. And I just think it's uh, exciting. So one of the things I mentioned in the, uh, one of the slides is the proactive versus reactive in terms of time. And just thinking back to the previous session, you know, they talked about how they had a, I think it was a grant to work on uh, developing that OER for like a year, a year and a half, something like that, which I thought was fantastic. Um, I know way, way back when we were developing You Do It, it took a little over a year as well. And so I think, you know, developing these tools and, and resources and all that, you know, I think it's just a really helpful perspective to say, yeah, it's going to take some time. Uh, and, you know, with the accessibility or universal design approach, really kind of being mindful and going, you know, as we build this and develop this content, let's make sure that it's you know, meeting the guidelines as best as we understand them at this point in time. And then, you know, if it's used and then you're getting some kind of alert from, for example, your student accessibility services office saying, hey, student can't get access to this part of the content, uh, you know, hopefully you're going to be much more nimble to be able to remediate whatever that concern is. Because you've already been thinking about it, right? It's been part of the recipe, if you will, in your development of that content. Um, and as I was kind of thinking through some resources, I noticed uh, or noted on my second slide, uh, the OER Commons has all kinds of stuff about digital accessibility. So, and I would kind of think, you know, possibly some of these more interesting questions, maybe somebody has already come up with an answer for that and they've got it posted. Uh, with 432 results, <laughs> I think there's there's a, a good possibility. And then when I narrowed that search to just career and technical education, uh, it came up with 39. So so there's a lot of information available to us, which is so exciting. And um, I've been tickled to see how you do it is uh, continuing to flourish and develop, and you know on the UCF side as well as the City Lab side. And I think we've got more uh, ahead with that particular tool, but it will still always be a starting point. It is, it is you know, even if it gets to 99%, um, I'm still going to say, you know, get those human eyes for that last 1% uh, to make sure it's all good. 
because we, we own our content. And I feel like that's kind of the big message here is, you know, we really want to own it and make it the best it possibly can be in every respect and making it as open and accessible, right, as possible. So. There are a number of resources that have been added to the end of the, the Google Doc. Um, so we are going to maintain this document. If you have questions that you have after the fact, um, please let us know. We're happy you know, to, to try to address those as we can. Yeah, that's um, awesome. Let's see, how effective do you think Adobe Express and Canva are for digital accessibility? Oof. Um, Canva has its challenges. It's gotten better over the last couple of years, but it's, um, I'll just leave it at that. It's, it, it's a challenge. Um, Karen, I don't know if you've played with Canva much for online development. Yeah. And again, I think, you know, like if you're developing, let's just say an infograph, for example, um, you know, you want to make sure you have a, you know, for example, a Word doc text equivalent with that same information. And if it's really visually heavy that, you know, you have something that's descriptive as to, you know, how that visual works or how that information flows or whatever is involved. Um, you know, I feel like uh, the alt text is, you know, and many times it's even called captions, right, for your image. Um, at least it used to be in the newspaper, right? You'd have your little caption. And, and like my first slide, I've got a uh, caption, right, under a little image I put on there from a course I took a couple of years ago uh, of this uh, keyboard uh key that, uh, you know, is introducing us to his keyboard family. <laughs> so, um, but anyway, just giving those descriptive images uh, information, it's, it seems like no big deal, but it really is helpful, even for those of us, you know, like if you hover over it, you know, hopefully in most cases that alt text will appear. And, you know, many of us can go, oh, that's why you put that there. It's that's what it is, right? Because not all images are crystal clear either. So any help we can give for everybody, you know, I think if we can just have, if you will, I hate the word assume, but if we can, you know, at least take into consideration that we've got an excellent chance, somebody is engaging with our content that has a challenge, right? Um, you know, I see Kevin and I both are wearing glasses, right? We've got our accommodation right on our, right on the front of our faces. And thankfully it's, it's also, you know, become a fashion statement, right? So it's not weird uh, anymore for anybody to wear glasses, but, you know, I think if we can kind of have that same perspective that, you know, we're really just trying to make it as easy to access as possible for everybody we can possibly think of. And then when we have the more unusual thing and the accommodation is required, it's not such a, a big burden. Um, you know, we're pretty much ready to go. I do want to loop back because I want to thank whoever went into the Google Doc and provided a great response um, about the question about uh, Canva, or, uh, Canva or Adobe Express, especially around infographics and, and providing that that narrative, the Word document that's basically doing that full description of the infographic. That's a great tip. Um, I also wanted to draw your attention that I just uh, added a PDF to the chat. This is an open source document, so feel free to, to download it, distribute it, change it as you see fit. But it's something that we did at my last institution where we just basically went through that structure. Um, I think it was an earlier question of where should faculty start if they're new to this. And it goes everything from, do you have a disability statement through, have you evaluated any publisher materials? Uh, are, you, uh, are you clear in your course navigation through facilitation? And then it goes through some of the document pieces, some of the same elements that we talked about around fonts and color contrast and what have you. And each one of these segments has links uh, for remediation or guidance. So again, feel free to, to change, update, distribute in any form or fashion. Is there a Google Doc separate 
from the doc that can, contains the two slides. Yeah, sorry, I just um, um, you just referred to a Google Doc, so I was wondering if you're referring to the one with the two slides that was shared just just recently, or if there's a separate Google Doc that's got different content. Oh, there is a collaborate. Oh, thank you, Amanda. Uh, just threw it in the link. There is a document that uh, all the questions that have been fielded and any suggestions, not only what Karen and I have provided, but folks that are on the on the session. I've been providing feedback, links, resources. There's a a great list of just a, a variety of links that I would hope that folks copy this, save this document, come back to it, contribute to it. Yes, yes. This is yeah. This is a gold mine. This is fantastic. Thank you, everybody. So Add we have more. about two minutes left. So just want to make sure that if you do have a burning question. Uh, and that we haven't addressed it, that we have an opportunity to do that. Um, if not, I'll do a little bit of filler time. Uh, you know, for the folks that work with me here in the Center for Distributed Learning, they're probably sick of me saying this, but I, I really see accessibility and open education being two branches off of the Universal Design for Learning tree. You know, where OER, because of the open license, really um, addresses barriers from a cost perspective or even uh, an engagement perspective. And accessibility is really looking at those technical barriers. This is all part of that piece of having a universal design so that everyone with all abilities can participate. So uh, I see OER and accessibility tied at the hip. They're, they're sisters within the, the same family. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. I think one last thing I would just share, um, I debated about putting it in, but I, I didn't want it to be distracting, but um, over the years as I've worked with faculty on this uh, accessibility and you do it and having that conversation, um, you know, very often I would, especially a few years ago, I would get a lot of pushback. And I think, you know, again, it still happens. Uh, but some of my colleagues and I have come up with a, a framework we call invitational design. And it's just the perspective of the uh, instructor is the host, the students are the honored guests, right? Because they've paid all this money to enroll in your course. And then your online course is your home. And so making your, your course content yours as the instructor, you know, personalizing it in a way that is reflective of how you teach and your life and however much you want to share um but it also you know puts in the element of accessibility and universal design because you want your students to be able to navigate well you want them to engage you want them to have that powerful transformative experience together as much as possible so you know acknowledging that just as like you when you have a physical guest you know you have family come over to your house right you turn the house upside down to get ready for them but you do that because you care right and you care about how you come across you care about their experience right you want them to come away with a memorable and maybe even transformative educational experience so i think kind of taking that invitational design framework and applying it to whatever you're working on, to me, that lightens the load. It just empowers that, you know, I'm involved, this is mine, and I'm going to make it awesome, and we're going to have a memorable uh, experience as a result uh, with hopefully fewer barriers, right? But if we encounter the barriers, we're, we're nimble and ready to, to work with that and get that resolved. So anyway, I would, I would finish with that thought because I've, I've found it, at least for me personally, very powerful. We thank you all for attending, and we do hope that you have time to come back 4 p.m. Eastern time for our closing session. It's going to be a, a great discussion about how librarians and OER advocates can work together and, and our UCF librarians providing some perspectives on how they've been successful. So thank you for spending the hour with us, and we hope to see you later on today. Thank you, everyone.